Welcome to Anchor Church. We recognize uh, that people are gathering all around the South Sound in house gatherings. And that means you're probably, some of you are in North Tacoma, some of you are in Gig Harbor, some of you in Lakewood or East Tacoma, South Tacoma. And we know some of you are also uh, not in house gatherings. You're in the comfort of your own home and you're watching. And we're so glad uh, that for everyone that's tuning in, I do want to take a second to uh, pause. And if you are in a house gathering, look at the host, turn towards the host, everybody shift towards the host. And would would you just give them a round of applause? They have uh, taken time to open up their home um, on a Sunday morning. Uh, They've done a lot of work inviting people, making sure they feel comfortable. And so we want them to feel honored. So be clapping for them, celebrate them, do the, you know, the elbow, uh, you know, greetings and thank yous, whatever is most comfortable for you. We want them to feel like they're honored hosts. We're so thankful for you. Hey, we're going to be getting into uh, Matthew chapter four, verses one to three. um, And I'm going to read the text and I want to invite you to engage in, in one of three different ways. The first way is just simply listen to the text Um, You can also view it on the back screen there, but you can just listen to the text, um, engage just like you would normally if you were in um, here at our actual physical building. The second is you might want to open your Bible or the app on your phone, your Bible app on your phone, and be looking at the text um, yourself. We use the NIV, um, but you're welcome to look at whatever translation that you use. Um, The third is you might want to actually just close your eyes and hear these words. Uh, as words uh, that God is going to be using to teach and instruct and challenge and comfort you. So with that said, I'm going to pray briefly, and we're going to dive into looking at Matthew chapter 4, verses 1, actually to 4, um, as we continue in our Lent series and uh, the journey of forming a reality-tested faith. So let's pray and dive into Matthew chapter 4. God, we want you to be honored in this place. I pray for all of the hosts and those gathered in house gatherings right now that they might feel comfortable where they're at, but even more so present to you. I pray also that those streaming, watching the stream from uh, someplace other than a house gathering, whether it's the comfort of their own home or on their iPhone, wherever it is, Lord, we pray that you might be starting to work in their hearts in ways that they haven't felt you before. We, we desire to move into new territory in this unique time um, in our nations, our churches, our city's history. We pray that you would do this work for your glory and for our benefit, for the good of the places we live in, In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. So Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, reads as follows. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. Tempted by the devil. And after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. (laughs) Understatement. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. The question of who are you is, I think, the most essential question of our existence. When you hear that question, you might hear it like aggressively, like, who are you? Or uh, more maybe gently, just like, hey, who are you? Uh, With kind of an interest, a relational interest. But it's the most essential question to your life. You might think of, when you hear that question, like what's on your Facebook profile, your music interests, whether it's country or hip hop, uh, you know, your hobbies, whether it's uh, collecting baseball cards or going hunting, or you might think of your relationship status. I'm a dad, I'm a wife, I'm a son. I'm a daughter, or your vocation. I work at the city, I work at the church, I'm a teacher. There's all sorts of different ways that you could answer that question. But I want to say it again because I do believe it. It is the most essential question to our existence. In fact, it's what the enemy is trying to come at Jesus and get him to forget here in this passage of Scripture. Now, 
you might think that this passage is all about food and hunger. I mean, that kind of makes sense because Jesus uh, is hungry. It says that in verse two, he was hungry. And the enemy, the tempter, he says, you know, turn these stones into bread. So at the surface, it looks kind of like pretty simple. Jesus is hungry and the devil is trying to exploit that as an opportunity. I want to suggest that actually there's something more significant uh, happening here. And it's tied to the very nature of identity. Who are you? You see, Satan's temptation begins with three words. If you are. If you are. Isn't that interesting? He comes forward with a suggestion, with a question. Not with a direct attack, a bold statement coming right at Jesus, but he just kind of comes in, says, hey, if you are. And the following four words, the son of God. If you are the son of God. Satan doesn't say um, you're not the son of God. Those of us who have been in arguments, I think that's probably everyone, uh, have been in a situation where we've come face to face and we've, we've kind of made the direct attack, you're wrong. And what that typically does is it galvanizes the opposition to be more committed to their position. Satan knows that move. Rather than directly attacking Jesus and saying, you're not the son of God, he just presents a subtle suggestion. If you are the son of God, you see, this is what I, I believe is being communicated here in Matthew 4. More than just food, rather than the tempter trying to just play on Jesus' hunger, the tempter wants Jesus to doubt who he is. In fact, I want to suggest that this is what happens with every temptation. It might be a, a kind of a big example, but infidelity in marriage is not the husband or the wife being lured away towards another, though that is what infidelity means. But I want to, you know, really it's something more basic. It's the husband or wife forgetting who they are, forgetting their identity. You see, this is what identity is. Identity is this network and overlapping relationship of, of a role and a relationship. The role says the significant part you play in the world as it relates to this relationship. And you can even further draw this out, and you'll love this as a preacher. It's, it happens to be more ours. So there's a role and there's a relationship. But in this role and relationship, there are also rights and responsibilities. So if a husband or a wife starts forgetting the role and the relationship and the rights and the responsibilities then you all of a sudden have somebody that's vulnerable to attack. This is how temptation happens. The enemy tries to meet you in a place where you're forgetting who you are and exploit that opportunity, whatever it is. So this is what happens with Jesus. Satan comes to him and says, if you are the son of God, dot, dot, dot. He questions his identity. Now, it's significant because, you know, back in Matthew chapter 3, the thing that the Father says about Jesus is that, Jesus, you are my beloved son. I delight in you. Somehow Satan knows that. I don't know if he was there, but he knows that. And he comes at Jesus at that precious point. You think about... Um, when you get somebody to forget who they are, you take them out of the game. Think about it in sports. If I get somebody to forget their role on the team, they start acting like a different role, a different part, a different player. Then all of a sudden, the whole team starts to feel it. I used already the example of husband and wife, but examples and examples could be heaped upon examples. If I get you to forget who you are, then I weaken the whole network that you're connected to. 
That's why the question of who are you is the most essential question we can answer about ourselves. There's an example, and I've used this before. Um, it comes from the Netflix movie The Crown, which Candace and I like. Um, and uh, Queen Elizabeth, well, The Crown is, is this drama that documents it through uh, kind of, you know, historical fiction, uh, the legacy of British royalty um, through successive generations. And there's this one scene where Queen Elizabeth is uh, being fitted for her crown. And you can tell she's kind of perched there in this chair, um, sitting uh, uncomfortable. She's a young woman, and you can imagine she's feeling the weight of an entire country rest on her shoulders. And the person fitting her for her coronation is placing the crown on top of her head. And you can tell she squints and she's nervous. She's remembering her father as he approached his coronation and the stress that he felt. And there in the fitting room for the crown, uh, she asks this question of the person helping her. She says, could I take it home? And could I, could I borrow it? And um, he says something in return. He says, borrow it. From whom? It's yours. I think this is oftentimes how we relate with our identity in Christ, is that we've been given a status of royalty. We've been given this beautiful identity because of what Christ has done on the cross. The Father speaks a better word over us than the world. The Father says, you're my kid. I love you. That's been a major theme through our series so far. You're my kid. I love you. And oftentimes we interact with that. We don't know what to do with that. One, we haven't heard somebody give us such positive affirmation without performance and achievements connected to it. So we feel like there's this reluctance, like I don't deserve it, which is grace. And so we kind of sit nervously feeling like the crown isn't ours, feeling like, can I, maybe, can I take it home and borrow it? To which the father responds, borrow it, it's yours. You see, if the enemy can get people to think that the crown is not theirs and borrowed, if the enemy can get Jesus to think in the wilderness that the crown is not his, that is the identity, the words of the father aren't his, it's borrowed. If, if that's what the, the enemy can do that, then he knows that there is no redemption for the world because Jesus is the one that brings about redemption. And so Jesus, the, the enemy doesn't go after just the behaviors of Jesus, but he goes after the very identity of Jesus. The behaviors are one thing, but you know, really he wants Jesus to not feel like he can go forward because the world will not experience redemption. What would happen to your life if Jesus started thinking at that moment in the wilderness, maybe I'm not the son of God. Here's the thing. In this moment in time, the world has never needed Jesus' followers to believe who they are more. Let me clarify that. At this point, the world... Uh, it might be an exaggeration, but uh, at this point, the world needs followers of Jesus to believe that they are who they are. Because here's some things that scripture says that Jesus' followers are. We're salt. You know, and uh, salt not only makes food better, but it also preserves it. Jesus says that we are salt. We are like, we're, we, we make, we, we, fla we bring flavor to this world. And we preserve this world. Jesus says that we are light, that we bring light. You know, light never loses when light battles against darkness. You turn the light on and all of a sudden there's light. Jesus says that you are light. He calls you his kids. And sometimes we look at ourselves, we look at our insignificance or our seeming insignificance. And we say, uh, well, this, can I borrow it? This, is, this surely isn't my identity. Right now, the world, in the midst of this, this, the challenges that we're facing with COVID-19 and the, how the ripples, you know, how it's affecting economies and families, 
how it's affecting neighborhoods and schools. The church needs to be the church. Just like we needed Jesus to be Jesus, the world needs you to be you. To make peace with the fact that you're loved by God and called to be a part of his mission in his world. No matter your limitations and your struggles, he's calling you. That's what the world needs for followers of Jesus to actually trust who they are. It's kind of, kind of interesting. The world needs you to be you. I want to look at a, a little bit about this guy, the tempter, because I'm, uh, you know, like we don't know what to do with the enemy or, or personal spiritual evil. You know, in the Western world, we, we like um, things that can be tested in a test tube, uh, things that can be reduced to the scientific method. If we can get things to fit into the scientific method, then we can be sure that they're real. Whereas three quarters of the world right now actually believes that spir personal spiritual evil is a normal part of what it means to live in reality. Throughout history, you, you've had both of these things. You've had on the far end, you've had superstition which kind of believes that, you know, there's something, something demonic or, or evil, spiritual evil hiding behind every rock. There's superstition. And then there's also always been scientism. Scientism meaning that if it can be repeated and tested over periods of time, we can document it and put it in a, a refereed scientific journal and know that it actually is verifiably true. These are extremes, superstition and scientism. Scripture shows not an extreme, but just documents reality. Scripture talks about antagonistic, personal, spiritual forces that are seeking to get you to be who you are in light of the Father's voice. There's three words here um, documented um, in the Matthew 4 that describe kind of the enemy's aims. The first is tempted. Uh, that Jesus went into the wilderness to be tempted. The Greek word for tempted um, is to obtain information uh, with the point of exploiting a person based upon the information gained. Uh, that's a lot of words. I'm, but tempted, obtain information to be used against a person. You can think about like, interrogating, um, gossiping, to learning something about somebody to exploit them. And the second uh, word we see connected here in Matthew chapter 4 is devil. This word that we often have connect, we like have this idea of what the devil looks like. And, you know, it's been characterized by whether medieval, you know, kind of pictures and cartoons and all these different places. But the word devil just literally means in the Greek, slanderer. Slanderer. You know, I mean, if you've ever been slandered, I hope not. If you've ever been slandered, you know, a slander is something that goes after the core of who you are. Uh, slandering is an assault on identity. This is what the devil does. He comes at your identity. The next word we see in Matthew 4 used to talk about the enemy, it's another word describing who he is, not a verb saying what he does, but another word noun describing who he is, and it's tempter. And the Greek word for tempter is to tempt or try someone with the intent to harm them. To tempt or try someone with the intent to harm them. You see, we learn from Matthew 4 that the enemy's whole point is to extract your identity from your personality. You've ever had like, you know, I remember growing up being in, looking at my mom's cupboard and there's like things like orange extract, lemon extract. You know, what is that? Like these little jars. What it is, is it's the most lemony parts of the lemon extracted from the lemon. Orange extract is the most orangey parts extracted from the orange. 
The enemy wants to take the most you parts of you away from who you are. And so you still might be an Enneagram 6 or an INFPJ or an I on the disc profile, but your identity has been extracted. And you're living with this hollow sense of who you are, walking around, always trying to find who you are and never finding who you are. And when that is the case, the enemy has actually won. That's what the enemy wants to do. The enemy wants to extract your identity from your personality. And to do this, uh, he begins with a question, if you are the son of God, but then he moves to an idea. He begins with a question, just a suggestion, and then he moves to an idea. It begins with, if you really were the son of God, but then it says, but then he says, uh, well, turn these stones into bread. Tell these stones to become bread. And here's where we usually focus our energy. It's that, oh, sure, he's playing on Jesus's hunger. But let me, let's go back to the whole identity concept. You see, what is a father? What does it mean to be a son and a father? A father is, no doubt, especially in this time, someone who, if it's a good father, provides and protects. A father is one that provides and protects. So the enemy is saying, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. You know, like, if you are the son of God, essentially what he's saying is, if you are the son of God, like, like where's your dad at? You're clearly not being provided for. If you are the son of God, like, your life would probably be a little bit better, right? I mean, look how gaunt you are, Jesus. You look messed up. We don't know if Jesus was tempted all throughout the 40 days or just if the enemy came at the end. The text is unclear, uh, but either way, it's a challenge. If he's met at the point of total fatigue and famine and hunger, or if he's constantly barraged day by day. Either way, it's a challenge. And I can imagine it could be hard to hear the question and maybe the doubt. I, I mean, I, I don't think that it happened for Jesus, but I probably would happen for many of us. You start thinking, well, yeah. He said he was, I, I was his son and that he loves me, but here I am hungry. I don't know why I am actually here. Why am I doing this? Why am I enduring such challenge? Shouldn't the evidence of my sonship reflect a better position in life with a bit more comfort? Aren't I, in fact, loved? And the enemy's like, yeah, tell it. I mean, you could, I mean, you should be better fed if you really were the son of God. Right? You see, the enemy begins attacking our identity, but he, he doesn't stop. It gets farther. He begins with a suggestion and he moves to an idea. The tempter doesn't care if Jesus is hungry. He wants Jesus to forget who he is. You see, the eremos, which is the Greek word for wilderness, we've been using this term, the eremos, the wilderness. The wilderness is a place where one of two things happens. Either your identity is extracted or your identity is deepened. The Ramos, the wilderness does one or two things, two things. If I was to be, if I'm in total honesty, it, the enemy extracts your identity because you start thinking, yeah, you're right. If this is who I am in Christ, my life should look differently. Or, in the face of the wilderness and everything is being stripped away, as you're experiencing challenges, it deepens a sense of you knowing who you are. I remember um, years ago, I was in a really challenging point in my life. And I mean, since then, I've experienced many other really challenging points in my life. But, but this moment was like felt really difficult. And I, I remember I went somewhere to pray. I was still a fairly recent Jesus follower. And I was praying um, and I, you see, I, I wanted something to happen in my life that ha wouldn't happen. It wasn't happening. And I felt anguish and anxiety and stress about this. And I remember praying and I, 
I didn't get the answer I thought I was going to get from God or that I wanted. You see, if you go with me, there's this passage in Scripture in, in Acts chapter 4 where John and Peter are walking by. It's called the temple gate called Beautiful. Um, and there's a beggar there who's been lame since birth, and he's asking for gold and silver. And Peter looks him right in the eye, and he says, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. Okay, so go with me back to my moment where I'm in a place of extreme challenge and pain and something I desire, you know, like isn't happening. I felt God, I heard God as much as one can hear God share the same words with me. Brian, silver and gold I don't have. I don't have silver and gold for you. I know what you want and you're not going to get what you want. It's not the right time. It's, just, it's, it, it's silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of, in my name, walk, walk. Walk in who you are. Don't doubt. Believe. Know that you have a crown on your head because you're my kid. Not because of your greatness, but because of I'm great. And I've transferred my identity to who you are. Live in that. Breathe in that. Operate in that place. If you know you're God's kid, I believe this, you can walk through any desert. If you know your royalty, you can walk in royalty. If you know your identity, you're never going to be looking for your identity because you know that it's given to you. You see, the, the enemy, on the other hand, comes with a question and moves to an idea. Your life should be better if you were really the son of God, if you were God's kid. You, he probably would be taking care of you better, but the Aramos, the wilderness, always presents that opportunity. It can extract your identity or deepen your identity. What is happening right now for you? We are uh, in, if I would be honest, a wilderness time. Not just with Lent, though uh, it, it dovetails nicely, I guess. But we're in a wilderness time. What do you find yourself, what do you find happening in your heart? I know many people struggle with health anxiety and uh, it feels sometimes like a cul-de-sac or keep going around this cul-de-sac of, of, of stress, thinking, is this the coronavirus? And some of you might be feeling kind of an anxiety about that. What does it look like for you? And I, without simplifying anxiety, what does it look like for you to start leaning in to who the Father says you are? For those of you that maybe have uh, compromised immune systems, your, your, you know, your, your health isn't what you would like it to be or maybe what it was, and you're finding yourself having to self-quarantine or really um, embrace social distance, you know, like, wh like, what does it look like for you right now to really to dwell in the words of knowing who you are? Maybe none of this is affecting you. Or maybe it is the economic pieces. And you're looking at the market and you're looking, seeing, you know, things kind of trending in the direction you wouldn't prefer. What does it look like for you to hear the Father's voice? For you to know who you are? Maybe you aren't affected by those things, but, but I would say it doesn't matter if like something from the news is, is affecting you or not because we're always being, a, the tempter is always coming to us to try to present a question and then an idea. If you are, wouldn't your life be better? You see, in response to this, you know, Jesus, Jesus responds. And the first is, is that he says, it is written. In verse 4, chapter 4, verse 4, he says, it is written, which I love because, you know, like when you say it is written, you know, you're saying like this doesn't change depending on the circumstance. It is established. It is written. It's not stop. It's not going to change. We're not editing it out. We're not erasing it. It has been written. You know, when you say it is written in a challenging moment, you're saying something that isn't changing is defining something that 
is changing. My circumstances change, but I'm anchoring my identity in something that isn't changing. It is written. That's Jesus' response to the enemy. It is written. Yeah. Oh, you know what? You know, you would, you, my, my circumstances don't change my identity. In fact, the Father is allowing me to experience this at this moment because it will help me deepen a knowledge of who I am. It is written. Something established and, and, and constant is anchoring me in something that's changing. But secondly, he's, the verse he quotes, and he he's, seems like he's meditating on Deuteronomy because every verse he quotes to the enemy is from Deuteronomy. It's interesting. Uh, he, says, you, so he says, it is written, man doesn't live on bread alone, but every word that comes from or proceeds from the mouth of God. Um, this is fascinating because uh, what, uh, what's the last words that we, we know Jesus has heard from the mouth of God? Jesus has heard Matthew 3, 17, this is my son, my beloved son, not just my son, but this is my beloved son, identity, delight, who I'm well pleased with. So Jesus is saying to the enemy, he's saying, it's written. He's anchoring his identity in something secure, even though his circumstances are changing. Some of us need to do that. When the, come, when, when, when the temptation to be scarcity-minded in the grocery store or to freak out in face of the health anxiety or to retract in self-protection or to whatever other situation that you might be experiencing regarding you know, what's in the news or just what's in your head, when that temptation comes to shrink back from who you truly are, you might have to know something from God's word and say, well, it is written. This is defining me and it's I'm anchoring my sense of who I am, you know, to something that's fixed in my changing circumstances. I won't let my circumstances to dictate my identity. I won't let the tempter define who I am, put the suggestion and the idea in front of me. I will say it is written. You might go back to some of those verses that we just mentioned earlier at the beginning of this talk. I am salt. If I'm a follower of Jesus, I am the salt of the earth. I am Jesus is light in the world. I am a part of community. I am uh, a part of this family. I'm, I am God's. These are things where you can say, it is written. You might also um, dwell like Jesus did in the voice that comes from the words that come from the mouth of God. You see, he was quoting Deuteronomy. But the words that came from the mouth of God were identity-forming words spoken over him. You are my son with whom I am well pleased with. You might need to draw and and eat and, and, and receive strength from those words in your wilderness moment. You see, Jesus was able to face the enemy with truth because he knew who he was. And he was feasting on the words from the Father as loved, as his. He was able to answer the question, who are you? And say, I am God's beloved son. With, he's well pleased with me. That's the word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So in closing, you know, we have a moment as Jesus followers. We have a moment in this time, in this fragile situation, in our current moment. We have a moment to lean into who we are. And that will do two things. It will embolden us. It will cause us to have a greater self-confidence, not based upon our self-effort or accomplishments or achievements or anything like that, but based upon the Father's voice, his estimation of us, 
the power of the Spirit that He wants, desires to see working in through us, that we'll be, con- that, that His plan for us is to look more and more like Jesus. It will give us, when we, when we live into and know who we are, we will get a sense of strength to live confidently in this world that would seek to dismantle confidence and extract identity. We'll just, we'll just be more confident in who we are. We'll be able to look people in the eye. We'll be able to just not be afraid and timid, you know, trying to figure out who we are. We'll know who we are. We'll do that. It will give you a greater sense of self-confidence. But secondly, it will allow you to serve the world. Because when you know who you are as a follower of Jesus, you know you're, you're called to God and you're also called to the world. Anchor Church distributed all over the South Sound and, and beyond those, uh, those of us else that are streaming and listening to this, you have an opportunity to rest in the words of the fa- kind words of the Father, to know who you are and know you're called to the world. What does that look like for your neighbor? What does it look like for those that you know that are wrestling with health anxiety at this moment? What does it look like for those that you know that have health problems? You're going to see a number of things throughout the next couple of weeks that we're going to be putting online as resources and ways that we can serve our community and live for the good of Tacoma, the greater South Sound. And, and, and we want all of us to engage in it. We want our house gatherings to continue to grow. There might be somebody in a house gathering that, that, that is actually feeling called right now to possibly host another house gathering. We want you to know that that's something. We, we want you to feel called and, and competent to do that. We, we want to be the church in this time. Anchor, that's what we're called to do. We're called to know who we are. We're called to live for the world. And we do that when we hear and know the Father's voice over us. Let's pray. I would invite you just to ex- extend your hands um, as, a, as a picture, not of magic, but just saying yes to what you've heard. So, Father God, by the power of the Spirit, would you conform us to your, the image of Jesus? Would you do that work of, of, of reminding us of who we are? When the enemy seeks to extract identity, would you, would you, would you tap our shoulder? Would you put people in our lives to remind us, to whisper truth, Lord, help us to, to, to live for the good in this moment. Help us to know who we are. We pray these things in the name of Jesus.